Would you like to remember what you study without hardly any effort? If so, that's great. You're in the right place because I'm going to talk about memory techniques and the role they play in being a good student of learning anything you want to learn without all the stress and strain everyone else has to go through. Hey there, this is Anthony Metivier from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. Who am I to talk about remembering what you study? Well, in addition to a PhD in humanities, the history of science, technology, and religion, I used memory techniques to help me pick up a second MA and eventually win a huge research grant that let me live out my dream of reading even more books and remember more of them. And if you'd like to make your living doing what you love and just need to remember more of what you read, get subscribed to this channel, hit the thumbs up, and let's get started. Number one, the memory palace. The number one tool that helped me is the memory palace. There's a few reasons why it's so profound as a learning tool. First, it helps you organize information. Second, it helps you space multiple details out in logical sequences that reduce cognitive load on your brain. Third, it helps you use a special process I call recall rehearsal so that you can get that information into long-term memory. There's a lot of science behind why and how this ancient technique works and has stood the test of time for centuries. But to make it brain dead simple for you, I've created a free four video course with three simple eBooks. You can find information about getting these free resources down in the description box below this video. Two, time control, not time management. Now, you might think that time has little to do with your memory. But that simply isn't true, and you might be wasting a lot of time punishing yourself with thoughts about your poor time management skills. If that's true, please stop doing that right now. No one can manage time, and time manages itself well enough on its own. The sun rises and sets without our help. That said, we can control how we behave in time by setting guidelines for when and how we're going to do things. For example, when I was reading hundreds of books to prepare for my field exams, I blocked out my reading time and my reviewing time. How exactly I review what I read we'll talk about in a minute. The point is that every hour was accounted for and tracked. Like creating and using memory palaces, this takes a bit of effort. And to be honest, I couldn't always stick to the schedule. But the fact that the schedule existed made progress so much easier because there was something I could stick to in the first place. And having a plan helps reduce overwhelm, and every time you knock a book down, you feel a huge sense of accomplishment. Three, organized reading. Let's be clear about something. If you want to be an expert at something or pass all your exams, you've got to be well read. Passive familiarity just won't cut it, even if there is a place for that level of reading too. But just because you need to read thoroughly does not mean that you have to read books in order. In fact, from a memory and learning perspective, doing so can lead you to disaster. To make sure I remember the most from books, I read all the paratext first. This means reading the back cover, the front cover, the colophon page, the table of contents, bibliography, any information about the author, the work cited, and the index. Although I might not read the index word for word, taking care to scan each column primes the mind for what the book contains. Combined with knowing the table of contents, you're helping your mind form a little cognitive map that later helps key concepts jump out at you. Next, I'll often read the conclusion first. Books for school are not mystery novels. You're in it for knowledge, not surprises. This trick doesn't work for every book under the sun, but more often than not, knowing how the author concluded helps you pick out more of the big points in a book and understand them better because you have more context. And after reading the conclusion, I will read the introduction and probably visit the table of contents again. I may read the most interesting chapters first and then fill in the gaps, or I will read the book cover to cover at this point. There's no fixed rule, but by following my interests first, I find that chapters that originally seem boring upon first read tend to be far more exciting when I've read the most interesting ones first. And the more interested you are when reading, the more likely you will remember the information naturally. Four, we've got organized note taking. Now I have a few different note taking strategies and these change depending on the outcome of the book. Having clear outcomes in advance is a whole video on its own, but I assume that if you want to remember what you study, your outcome is clear to you. If not, make it clear. It might sound like an unnecessary step, but many people find a contract they make with themselves or setting an intention in writing useful. 
in your memory journal or notebook, writing something like, I intend to thoroughly understand and remember the key details of this book in three sittings could make a huge difference for you. Give it a try. With the intention set, I generally prefer taking notes on index cards. Now this practice helps for a number of reasons, such as not having to encode the information in any particular order in a memory palace while reading. By writing notes on cards, I can change their order later and memorize them in the order most likely to help me get the details into long-term memory, which is usually nothing like the order those ideas or facts have been presented in the book. Likewise, if I'm gonna be writing an essay, article, or book, being able to move the cards around is helpful for trying out different outlines. It also allows me to easily insert new cards later for these purposes. Now there's a lot more you can do with index cards to link them with memory palaces, all things I cover in depth in the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass course called The Master Plan. Now the fifth point I have for you is magnetic imagery and recall rehearsal. Once you have all the information you want to memorize from a book, it's easy and fun to take your notes or index cards and translate them into magnetic imagery that will live for a while in one of your memory palaces. Although you can do a lot of this activity in real time while reading, I save that for casual reading. For example, using the major method for the dates of a historical figure or period is great while you're on the go, but for multiple points, this process is its own activity. You'll also move a lot faster and be able to harness the connections between related ideas and facts that only reveal themselves when information is gathered for memorization. And as you use your memory palaces and encode your images, you'll often see opportunities to use what I call a magnetic bridging figure. For example, when I read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, I typically use the image of him in Raphael's painting, The School of Athens. But in the sections on friendship, which is what I wrote my dissertation about, I used movie characters in my memory palace. After creating the associations to the key points Aristotle makes about the different levels of friendship, I just followed Woody from Toy Story around and other movie characters for as long as they were useful. Just as the memory palace itself reduces cognitive load, the more you can use bridging figures, the more you reduce the load. This reduction occurs because it's logical and obvious during recall rehearsal that this figure is involved in the next magnetic image. That way you can just trigger it off without having to start off cold. And this brings us to recall rehearsal. Now, sadly, a lot of people think the purpose of the memory palace is to house information forever. This is not at all the case. The memory palace lets you maximize the memory power of the primacy and recency effects through the serial positioning of odd and unusual imagery that helps you remember the information. When your magnetic imagery is striking enough and the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass is packed with exercises to make sure you can achieve this requirement with ease, you get what is called the von Reschdorf effect. Done well using proper recall rehearsal, you cannot help but remember the information you've placed in your memory palace due to the combination of these three effects and how easy and fun it is to give primacy and recency to each magnetic station and magnetic image in your memory palace. Now let's talk about the big five. I never suggest people stop there with all of this recall rehearsal stuff. Although the memory palace will be good enough in most cases, when you really want to shine, take a moment to use the big five of learning. Start with memory. Write out what you've memorized in the form of a summary from memory. Then speak the knowledge from memory. Find a lecture on YouTube or a podcast where you can listen to others speak about the topic. Then read an additional article in addition to your summary. Each additional step will process the information through multiple forms of representation. And because not everyone will put in any of this additional effort, when you do, you're going to stand out, take the top grades, and win all the prizes. Kind of like I did when I got an all-expenses-paid trip to research and teach my dream topic in Germany. And it's all thanks to the exact tips I've just shared in this video. But there's one last point I want to share. That's rest and physical care. It's no secret that I drank like a fish throughout university and barely slept. Frankly, that made me deeply depressed and I nearly lost my life as a result. Something far worse than merely just flunking out, which I also did at one point. And even though memory techniques saved me, I'm sh I sure wish I would have cleaned up my act sooner. There's no magic bullet and no magic numbers when it comes to guidelines for sleep and taking care of yourself, but there are some obvious rules of thumb, such as solid eight hours in bed, three times a week at the gym, and the basics of a memory-friendly diet, all of which I've covered before. You'll find links to resources on these points below. And all of this really does matter when it comes to reducing stress, inflammation, and other issues that make it difficult to concentrate. If you're not feeling well, 
Memory techniques will still help, but they really shine in a body that you treat like the champion racehorse you are, or at least deserve to be. You are, after all, the only one who is you, and that makes you very special indeed. So in sum, it's easy to remember what you study. Organize yourself, take care of yourself, and use the best memory techniques you can find. If you haven't hit that thumbs up button yet, do so now. Get subscribed if you're not a regular here already, and we'll see you on a live stream soon. And if you haven't taken the free memory improvement course, head over now to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT so I can show you just how fun and easy a well-formed memory palace network can be for your success as a person who wants to remember what you study. Thanks as always for the view, thanks for being here, and until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic.